All right, linear, linear imperfections we know are um, the, the mechanism for dislocation, uh, for, sorry, correction, for plastic deformation, right? We know that you get a dislocation and it allows the stepwise breaking and reforming of bonds. There's a really quick and dirty dislocation, right? And so we're starting to look at how other, well, how we can present obstacles or barriers to the movement of a dislocation. <clears throat> and what we're going to look at here is how the presence of dislocations can actually impede the movement of other dislocations. So the first thing to appreciate is that well, we've got to really understand the stress state here in this dislocation. And so I think what, what would help is if you pictured, if you imagined you had a piece of, uh, let's make a piece of cheese. So what color is cheese? Well, it can be many colors. Today it's going to be yellow. And the very best I can do here, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a piece of cheese that you're doing something to. What are you doing to it? Let's see if you can figure it out. That's a, it's a somewhat strange looking piece of cheese, but there it is, the delicious cheese, funny yellow colored cheese. And what are you doing? Well, you're trying to, to cut it, right? You're cutting it with, what are you cutting it with? Cutting it with a knife. Unless your knife or your knife is some sort of a wedge. You know, that's going to go down in there and cut the cheese, if you will. And if this is a piece of hard cheese, you may even know that the cheese actually starts to tear apart before the sharp edge of the knife gets to touching the cheese. The analogy I'm trying to build here is that, well, this extra, sometimes we call it half plane of atoms, okay? Half plane. Why? Well, because it doesn't continue all the way from top to bottom. It only goes halfway. It's a plane of atoms coming in and out of the page. It's a, it's a um, it's a plane of atoms. So that extra half plane of atoms is like the knife that's being inserted in. And this sharp edge here of the knife is like the dislocation line. That's the dislocation line, right? Dislocation. That's the linear feature, the tunnel, if you will, running in and out of the page. So <clears throat> what we're looking at here is what the stress state in the lattice is like because of the presence of the dislocation. Well, it's like the stress state in the cheese because of the presence of the knife. So as the knife goes in there, and then what I'll do is I'll draw the knife in there. So there's the knife. It's now actually in the cheese. Okay. So there's your knife. <laughs> it's a funny, it's a, that's a wedge. Okay. The knife is in the cheese. And what's it doing? Well, the knife pushes against the cheese, doesn't it? It pushes against the cheese. And what does that do? Well, that compresses the cheese. That's why, actually, you don't cut the cheese with, um, with a big, thick knife. I mean, the best bet is to use a thin wire. You, know, you can get a cheese cutter that's a thin wire, and it slices nicely through because it doesn't have all that compression. So similarly, this extra half plane of atom creates compressive stresses in the, la in the lattice. Compression. And what happens below the knife blade over here? Well, below the knife blade, we have tension. We have the knife blade actually, the presence of that knife blade is pulling the material apart even before the blade touches it. It's in tension. Similarly, the lattice down here is in tension. And the important takeaway from this is that we've got this stress field, or sometimes we call it a strain field, surrounding the dislocation. And that's actually, you know, stored strain energy. It's elastic energy, if you, if you like to think of it that way. It's elastic energy stored in the lattice in the form of these disturbances from equilibrium spacing. These atoms, if we modeled them, I drew them with these little green lines, but if you imagine, imagine them with little springs, well, these are being compressed and pulled in tension away from their equilibrium spacing, and that's energy stored as, as strain energy, strain energy, okay? So there's this strain field that surrounds the dislocation.
And so then what happens is, well, what if you've got one dislocation? That's fine. But what if you've got many dislocations? <clears throat> well, then it becomes many dislocations. Well, then the ha what happens is the strain fields interact. Uh, whoops. Strain fields interact. And they repel one another. Or they get in each other's way. There's some other ways. But they bump into each other, essentially. They repel one another. Okay, and the, the analogy that's often used, which is not too bad, is it's like people moving in a crowded train. You know, you're trying to get off of a train, maybe it's a subway, or you're trying to get off of a bus or something. If there's many, many people around you, it's difficult to move. Difficult to move. And what's the result? if it's difficult for a dislocation to move. If it's difficult for a dislocation to move, difficult for dislocation to move, well, what do we know about dislocation movement? Dislocation movement was this linear imperfect. It's, it's the mechanism for plastic deformation. Difficult for dislocation um, to move, that is going to lead to strengthening. It's harder to deform uh, plastically, so that's strengthening. Uh, strengthening. If I could spell, it would help. There, there you go. Um, difficult for dislocation movement. That means it's we've strengthened it. So, how do you get more people in a subway? You put more people in. How do you get more <laughs> dislocations in a material? Well, that's the interesting thing. Uh, you have to just take my word for it on this point. But plastic deformation. And you can look up the mechanism if you like. Um, but plastic deformation creates more dislocations. So when you plastically deform something, and uh, you know if you see the stress strain behavior for a metal like this, and it elastic, and it starts to strengthen, that strengthening is because you've created more dislocations, and then the dislocations run into each other, and they impede uh, their uh, one another's movement. And finally, just to give you a sense for how r really incredibly important dislocations are, if you imagine that you took a piece of metal, and you cut it up, um, you, you measure, you recorded, and I say you had one millimeter by one millimeter <clears throat> area, okay? You're gonna you cut from a piece of metal. And then what you do is you go through and you look at that in a really high powered microscope and you count the number of dislocations running through that um, square millimeter. So, and you count the number of dislocations, number of dislocation lines per uh, square millimeter, <clears throat> you'd find, I mean, how many do you think? What, what kind of number? I mean, you know, you got a mole of atoms is 10 to the 23, so you should be thinking probably a fairly good sized number, but these are imperfections in the crystal, so what are we looking at? Well, if you have a, on the low end, you can have about a thousand, 10 to the 3 dislocations, all the way up to, for something that's been heavily cold worked with a lot of plastic deformation, <clears throat> you could be up to about 10 to the 10, right? 10 billion dislocations per square millimeter. Square millimeter, that's a tiny little area. So there's a huge, huge number of dislocations in um, in every metal. In, uh, and most metals, so you look around you, most metals have been deformed somehow um, to their final uh, final shape.